Well, tonight we're talking about or continue our message. And it's a quite lengthy message. Actually, uh, uh, it's quite interesting. But I, I, we're talking about why is it my tithe or offering uh, not bring my offerings not bringing returns and so uh, we found out through scripture that it's about living right and giving right say with me living right and giving right a lot of people are confused because uh, they don't understand the proper way to give and the proper way to live according to the word of God so there's a lot of things that affects why your tithing isn't working and so there's many things but first of all we need to look at uh, do we understand uh, why, what are our offerings for? What are our giving? What's the reason for offerings? Do we understand that according to biblical, uh, the biblical way? And so we talked about uh, tithing, and I love that part that we talked about tithing. So the tithing has a motivation, and that motivation is obedience. Remember, the vot- motivation for tithing is obedience. So we're going to be talking about, uh, and then we talked about the first fruit. Say with me, the first fruits. And that uh, first truth, the motivation for that was gratitude. Say with me, gratitude. gratitude. And so we're thankful for the income that God gives us. And we talked about that uh, 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 Sunday. What a powerful message that was about. Amen. And so today we're going to talk about something that's called alms. The alms. The Bible is full about this. Uh, the Hebrew word for alms is almese. Almese. It's A-L-M-E-S-S-E. And it literally means pity and mercy. Now remember, everyone has a motivation. And the motivation for this is passion for mankind. Say it would be passion for mankind. Alms is having passion. Remember, tithe is for obedience. You're obedient. Uh, We talked about first fruit is where we have a heart of gratitude. We're thankful for our income. And then we're going to talk about alms. But before we start, let's go to the book of, of Acts in the New Testament. And let's look at something that we see. And the reason why we have to show you this, according to the word, because alms are in there, but our apostles, the apostles talked about this. In, all, excuse me, in Acts, the third chapter, verses 1, and let's quickly get to it, there's so much to cover tonight, but if we, don't, if we don't finish it, then we'll do it Sunday. We're not in a hurry to finish the series, because I want us to prosper in the area of financially. I want your tithe to be returned I want your tithe to work. I want your offerings to work. I want you to see this so that you can have some legal groundwork to stand in prayer and tell the devil, devil, you're a liar. I know what my offerings mean. I know what my giving mean. And I know what I'm giving. What I'm giving tonight is offering. So, Lord, I know what that is. You're not, you're not uh, shortchanging yourself. You're not, you're not confusing the return, the, the re- rate of return. And a lot of Christians do that because they don't understand So their rate of return is diminished. And that's why God said, this is why we have to return back to the purpose of it. Now, the book of Acts, pick it up in verse 1. Now, Peter and John, the disciples, went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. Uh, This was during the day. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried whom they lay daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms. There's that word alms of them that entered into the temple. So he's blind, poor, and he had to be carried. Now, who seen Peter and John go go into the temple asked an alms. There it is, an alms. Very careful, you have to see that. An alms. That's why they knew what alms was about. Peter fastened his eyes upon him with John and said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Peter said, now this is the key, Silver and gold have I none. So in other words, he's saying that alms has value. Gold and silver have I none. So in other words, I don't have any alms to give you. So he clarified, gold and silver have I none. But such as I have, I give thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up and immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the church or the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms. Now, very clearly, the Bible, the Holy Spirit wanted to see this man was 
the re was healed because he was the one that was set for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with amazement, wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto them. So in other words, we see something so powerful here. Alms. The way this man was carried, uh, the purpose this man was carried to the temple was because that's the Jewish people that would come in. And all the Jewish people taught, were taught that alms were to give to the poor. Now notice this. The word alms means pity and mercy. So the motivation for alms is having compassion to mankind. It is a good thing to have compassion for the crippled that are poor, the hurting. And notice this, we have to have compassion for hurting people. There are a lot of hurting people. And so the alms is helping people in crisis. Now God uses the church, and in this case, this man was brought to the temple. Peter and John did not have any alms, but they gave them the most beautiful gift of healing, and they received, he received healing, right? Now notice this, that means alms was part of this miracle. If this man wasn't there, this man would not get healed. So in other words, alms brought this man, as, as we may say it, to the feet of Jesus, right? Amen. Now notice, we go with me to chapter 10 now. Acts chapter 10. And I want you to see this. Acts chapter 10, verses 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms. Underline that. And, and I want you to underline what we're talking about here. We're focusing on alms. Which all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. So here's a man that gave much alms and prayed. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour, quite interesting, again, the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming to him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, what is it? But I want you to look at this. What is it, Lord? Whenever you see angel and the word Lord, reach for the word Lord because the Lord is represented here, not the angel. The King James, when they interpreted it, they interpreted it as Elohim. Elohim means what we do know, it is literally godlike. And so we find out he was speaking about Jesus. Now notice this. And when he looked up, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. So again, not only does tithing have effect, not only does first fruit have effect, but here we see already that alms given to the poor has a great effect. And God sees when you give to the poor. Amen. Now think about it right now. Think about it. If there were no understanding of the word, then we would literally be full of just so much confusion in our giving. And I think Satan knows that. And Satan loves it when the body of Christ doesn't understand their their, their purpose of giving. So he knows as long as he can keep them isolated from the word, then he has them. Poor people won't get fed. Uh, the, the house of God will be taken care of and things will not be handled right because of wrong giving. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Now, now, with that in mind, in the ninth chapter, look at the ninth chapter. We're in Acts. Ninth chapter 36. I want you to see something that goes deeper. And this is where I want you to see it. And and, and underline your Bible, highlight it, because this is going to help you put almsgiving. Because see, you're going to go back one day and you're going to really just, God is going to use you mightily in the area of helping the poor. Amen? Yeah. And notice what it says in Acts the ninth chapter, verse, um, verses 36. Are you there? Now there was at Jaffa a certain disciple named Tabitha, woman disciple. This is probably the first time you heard of this. Woman disciple named Tabitha, which by, which by interpretation is called Dorcas, 
This one was full of good works. Now notice this. Good works and alms deed which she did. Underline that word alms deed. Now right here we find that the word deeds were added to alms. This gives you an understanding that she practiced giving alms as a way of living, as a way of giving. This woman was a woman, if you study this woman, not only was she a woman of, of prestige, but a very wealthy woman. So she was a woman of good report, good works, and gave to the poor. But notice this, the word deeds. The Holy Spirit wants you to see that, deeds. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. Alm, uh, it said, let's go back to it. Where was it? 36. Notice what it says. She, she was full of good works and full of, what does it say? Alms deed. Alms deeds, which she did. So the Holy Spirit is bringing this out. So in other words, she was a habitual a person that practiced giving alms as a way of life. Now let's find out why the Jewish people do this. And in fact, let me tell you something. It's quite interesting if you study the Jewish people today, how they take care, first of all, the poor within their family. The Jewish people take care of poor within their race. The Jewish people take care of those in need around the race. In other words, they get together and say, okay, let's send so-and-so so to college, everybody. Let's all pitch in for somebody to college. Let's all pitch in to buy this person a house. Let's all pitch in to buy this car. This is the way the Jewish people work. We're missing something with this. Everybody's thinking about their own self. Think about it. If God wants us to help the poor, then let's start doing that so we become wealthy so that we can start taking care of business. If somebody needs a house in this church? All right, we're coming together to buy this house. Come on, let's get it together. Amen. We're going to buy tires for sister so-and-so. Let's got, buy some tires and send her to, good, to Goodyear or whatever or Firestone. Let's do it. Amen. Come on, church. This is the way alms works. Now, notice what it says in Proverbs now. I don't want you to miss out, so please do not be interrupted by anything. Remember, anything. The reason why I say that is because this is so important for us. Amen? So important for us. Hallelujah. Amen? Proverbs, the 19th chapter, verse 17. Hallelujah. Amen? And uh, let's look at it. Amen? Proverbs 19, verse 17. He that hath pity upon the poor. Now, right now, we're going into something. Lendeth unto the Lord, and that which he hath given will pay him back. Will he pay him back? Now notice this. Giving to the poor, the Bible says in verse 17, you're lending to the Lord. I've never seen that in the sense of giving to the poor. God now repays you because you're helping one of the needy. Come on, church. So that means God is touched by that. And how the devil would like to keep the church poor so that they don't help the poor. Amen? Amen? Now notice this. Lending to the Lord, you receive reimbursement. When you give to the Lord, he pays you back. The reason why is because you're extending the love and the mercy that God has to, and the pity that God has for someone that's poor. Now let me read it to you from the English Standard Version, that same scripture. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deeds. Amen? Amen? So in other words, I want to be able to be part of this. So in other words, I've got to find out that my tithing is for obedience. My first fruit is for gratitude for my income. And now my other giving that I'm going to activate is I'm going to focus on helping someone that is poor think about someone that is poor that can't meet a obligation can't meet a need if we all start thinking about that something will happen hallelujah amen go with me to proverbs 22 verses 9 see we we get into a thing that it's just me and my four and no more and then uh, we we you know you see people that are needy but we ignore it and you, we're, you know you're going to see poor people everywhere so that means we're going to have to find a way to ask god how to be able to touch some that we can not everyone jesus said the poor the poor you'll always have with you but you know it'd be great to touch who we can if it's among our family first if it's among our neighbors first if it's in this neighborhood amen if it's somebody that we know that needs a hundred dollar worth of groceries we go to sam's and buy them hundred dollar worth of groceries and just say look we love you here it is amen think about that 
Proverbs 22, verses 9, the Bible says, it says here, He that hath a bountiful eye, generous eye, shall be blessed, for he giveth of his bread to the poor. So in other words, if I read it to you in the Amplified, he who is generous will be blessed, for he gives some of his food to the poor. When was the last time we gave food to the poor? When was the last time we gave someone that was in a place that you're buying food and they're poor and you just ignored it? How many times have we passed by someone? Now I'm talking to myself too. I believe we have to get real about how to do this. And we're going to talk about that. Amen. And so we see that there is something so special about giving to the poor. Proverbs 21. Go with me to Proverbs 21 verses 13. And, and we're, 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 we're excited for what the word says. Now notice what it says. Who stoppeth his ear, 21, 12, Proverbs 21, 12. Whoso stoppeth his ears at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. Let me read it to you from this translation. If you stop your ears to the cries of the poor, your cries will go unheard, unanswered. Now notice this. Many people may not have answered prayers because that day we were not sensitive to reach out to the poor. Now, we're going to talk about more about this, but, but let's, just kind of, let's just kind of see this for what the Bible says so true. The Bible is true. God is true. God is so faithful to us that he wants to extend us. I'm telling you, I believe the Lord is getting, to a, getting us to a place to, we got to know before the wealth comes. We got to know so that we can increase with wealth. We got to know so that we can be properly, so that we can properly execute what God is saying for us. So that we won't ignore out there what God is saying or the church. Think about or the church. Amen. And so we have to realize this. So I want you to see something here. And this is quite interesting. Go with me to Matthew, the sixth, the sixth chapter. Jesus talked about this. And this is where we're going to land on some quite important issues here. And then we're going to talk about what do we do from this moment on. Amen. Jesus said this in Mark. Um, excuse me. Uh, Matthew, the sixth chapter. Thank you. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Let's look at. Uh, let's look at. Uh, praise God. There's so much here. Hallelujah. Let's look at this right here. Verses one. All right. Are you with me, church? Take heed, Jesus said this, so it's written in red, and he's speaking this, the Sermon at the Mount. And so he's speaking about benevolence. Say with me, benevolence. In fact, write that word down next to this scripture. Benevolence. Benevolence. And uh, someone here, uh, look up the word benevolence in the dictionary. If I can have Teresa, look up that word, Teresa. Look up that word benevolence in the in any translation, or uh, uh, Webster, whatever uh, dictionary, but let's read, all right? Let's all focus on Matthew, the sixth chapter, verses one. Take heed that you, not, you do not do, or take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. So in other words, um, it has to be something that has to be privately. And let's read on. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets. So evidently they must have been doing this in the church. I gave to so-and-so and I gave to so-and-so. I gave, I, you know, I gave to so-and-so. That, uh, that they may have glory of men and that's the purpose why they want to know so that, that people can give them glory. Verily I say unto you that ye, they have their reward. I, I, I will tell you this. Jesus said they will have their reward. The reason why is because no one could take the glory from God. God says he'll not share his glory to no one. So in other words, this is simply saying here, when I give, it's between me and God and that person. The reason why I'm doing it, because the Bible says I'm going to do it this way. I'm not doing it so that he can get glory. And this is the way people are. Now, listen, and never enter this place. 
there are people that become wealthy and they want to be known that they gave. I want my name on the door. I want my name on the suite of the hospital. If I'm going to donate millions, then I want my name on it. I want my, day, I want my name, Pastor, when I enter the church, that I'm the one that was the founder the, uh, that gave to this church. Listen, the Bible says they have their reward. Now, listen to this. Their reward means they've entered into something totally different from giving. When you give to somebody, and let's read on, let's read on. I'm getting ahead of myself, but let's read on. But when thou doest alms, Jesus said, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. In other words, keep it so secret that your hands don't know. That's pretty serious, right? Your hands don't know it. That thy alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. So in other words, these people that want signs on their door, if they were to do it secretly, then God will do something openly for them. I'd rather let God be the one that does something openly for me than me trying to blow the horn, toot my horn, and say, I did it, I gave, I gave, I gave, I gave, I gave. That is a dangerous place to be, church. You see what I'm saying? The reason why is because when you do it secretly, God sees what's in secret, and then he will deal with you and bless you openly. I love the way God does it. Every time I give to the poor, I don't let anyone know. Sometimes I don't even let my family know. But me and my wife are always knowing because we're together. But it's amazing how God immediately will do something. Immediately will do something in our life, in our personal life, in my personal life. And if I do it uh, in the office of a church arena or a, a covering of a church, then the church gets blessed immediately. That's how it works, ladies and gentlemen. So in other words... The Bible says, do it secretly. You know why? Because you're protecting the people's dignity. You should never tell anybody that you gave to somebody that needs help. Because you're not protecting their dignity. And let me tell you something. No one likes to be talked about that they don't have anything. So what do you do? You don't let your left hand or your right hand know what your left hand's doing. So you're doing it in love because God told you. And you're protecting dignity. That's what Jesus does. Think about the love of God. Amen. So in other words, when we're going to give, we're going to give, for number one, by the obedience of the Lord, alms to the poor, alms to the needy, alms to the ones that are running into some kind of crisis, financial crisis. That's why alms is needed. Now, let's go back to where I told you to write the word benevolence. Now, Teresa, did you find that word? Could you, sweetheart, read it loud? And, and that way those that are hearing can hear it also. The quality of being well-meaning. The quality of being well mean What is that? Well-meaning well and kindness. Now, notice this. If we will think about a benevolence, be benevolent. You're becoming kind, but you're also being kind to help the needy. Now notice this. Pastor, how can I help give alms? Let me tell you this. One of the things that we need to do in this church, and it's quite interesting that this is covering this, and we're going to talk about this down the road. Where does the tithe go? Where does the, uh, the first fruits go? Where the alms go? And then Sunday we're going to talk about seed giving. Seed giving, oh, that's powerful. I can't wait to teach that one. Because that one is the one that I see the most power in it. All of them are powerful, but, but for my life, I see seed. Because I put a something, I put a name on my seed. But I'm going ahead of myself. So in other words, uh, you may say, well, Pastor, how do we activate it? Do you know how we activate it? We set up in this church a benevolence account. In other words, you should never try to help the poor apart from your local church. In other words, it, 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 there's nothing wrong with you helping the poor outside the church, but if your church has a benevolence plan, then I would give to the church a benevolence so the church can use it, first of all, for the internal issues of the house. Maybe there's somebody in this house that's having a critical issue, financial issue, hard times. Uh, we need to extend mercy. Something can happen in this house. Somebody can walk in this door and need serious help. And if we don't have the benevolence set up, 
then we'll be able to, we're going to have to go into the tithe, which is not the purpose for giving to, the, to having compassion on the needy, or we can go into the first fruits. Well, first of all, in other words, you know what I'm talking about, right? You know what I'm talking about. In other words, we've got to know how to do this. And it's quite interesting, the, the ministries that have the benevolence set up, they're able to do it without any questions. It's amazing, there are some churches that literally, if you're a member of that church, and, 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 you, and you have a need, they will, they will take your name into account, and they will literally help you for whatever need it is. It might be a light bill, it might be a car payment, it might be uh, an insurance payment, whatever it may be. It may be food. Ladies and gentlemen, this is so powerful. Now, in the days of the Old Testament and in the New Testament, that's what the reason why they had alms, to help the poor of the temple. That's why this man came to the temple asking for alms. And he said, silver and gold I don't have, but much as I have, I give unto you, arise and walk. So in other words, alms is purposeful in a house of God. Amen. We've had people come here many a times asking for help financially. Many a times. We had a family that their family member was dying. I can't remember how, brother-in-law, father, I don't know. Somebody was down in the house or down the road here, and they needed some help. Amen. And so we, we had to pull out of our pockets uh, to be able to help them. We didn't have it. And I told him, I said, sir, I am so, I apologize. We don't have a benevolence fund. In fact, maybe the church down the road, the big Baptist church has a benevolence fund. They can help you. But we don't have it. Uh, but, you know, but we ended up helping out of our personal. And so what happens if that happens again to our church? Or maybe one of us as members fall to a situation where, uh, you know, uh, they're not going to tell anybody. Uh, they're just, it's just going to be the Holy Ghost that's going to share it, or maybe they might share it with the pastors. But the thing about it is, I believe we need to activate it in this church. I believe we need to activate it. Amen. Hallelujah. I believe we need to focus on knowing the tithe is for obedience, my 10%, my first 10%. I'm obedient to the Lord. I'm not going to rob God. Listen, folks, we can't rob God with our tithe. Don't try to give the Lord just a tip of your tithe. People give tips of their tithe. You can't do that because you're robbing God and you're disobeying God. That's why things are happening to you. But if you'll be faithful and say, Father, tithe, I can't even touch it, Lord. It's so holy because it is yours, God. I'm obedient. Now, the first fruit can be anything, can be a, a big check that you got in the mail that you're so excited about. It, and you said, what? I'm going to give this to the church. I'm going to bless the church with this $100 check you got in the mail. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless the Lord because I got, a, I got a commission check or something, something. That's the first fruit. You're so thankful for me to come. I, talk to, I tell people that are in business, think about first fruits. The first contract that you get, instead of the first money that you get from a contract, the first contract, give it to the Lord as a first fruit. There will be many more contracts to come. Remember, first fruits is futuristic. It's looking forward for what's coming. Amen. And it's also thankfulness. I mean, you're thankful and have gratitude. Now, alms is because we have pity to the mer and mercy. We're merciful. We have people that have compassion. Now, I will tell you this. There's a lot of people that ask for money out there. Ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, what do I do? Holy Spirit, if he quickens you to do it, you do it. If somebody's asking for a dollar... And you have the Holy Spirit. Listen, you can use a dollar to minister to that person. You can say, hey, listen, I'll give you a dollar, but let me talk to you about something before I give you this dollar. I, you can pray for them. And half the time you can't because people, we've had people ask us for money and we stop and talk with them. Now, there's a lot of times that we don't give, but I'll tell you one thing is we don't give to people that are standing out there because we know nothing about them. They could be robbing. They could be alcoholics. They could, you're abating them. So what do I do, Pastor? Well, if the Holy Ghost says do it, do it. But if you don't do it, don't do it. Just listen to the Lord. But if you have a benevolence fund in your church and you say, I feel like today putting $5 in the benevolence fund, then you put down poor or benevolence or alms and it'll go to a certain account and that account will be built up so that we can help somebody in this house, someone that comes through the doors or someone that we run across or someone your pastor runs across somewhere amen can you say amen hallelujah amen so in other words uh, you're lending to the lord when you help the poor jesus was in a home and they were washing his feet with some expensive perfume and one person that was just a thief was judas he said don't spend it on him spend it on the poor and jesus said you'll always have the poor with you but this woman is doing something that will be remembered. 
And we know what she did. She prepared Jesus' death by fragrance. Amen. But the key that I want you to know, you'll always have the poor around you. You'll always have the poor around you. You'll always have the poor around you. But notice this. What if the poor is your family around you? What is the poor that are your loved ones around you that are poor? And, you've, and you just say, well, you know what? I know I'm going to give to the church my tithe, but they need it more, so I'm going to give them uh, to help them. You just, you just canceled your purpose of return. But if you'll focus on, you know what, God? I'm going to give, I'm going to, give to the alms. I'm going to give alms. Because alms is for, let's look at it again. What is alms for? Alms is for motivated for passion for mankind. It's helping people in crisis. Helping people in crisis. Alms is because you're helping someone. You're extending mercy and pity. And not only that, you're lending to God. Isn't that something God will always give to you? Did you get something, church? Hallelujah. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand up tonight. Hallelujah. Amen. God is so good. I tell you, this will be so good. And it'll be so wonderful as we, as we extend this. Now remember, what is the motivation for tithing altogether? Obedience. Obedience. What's the motivation for first fruit? Future. Gratitude, thankfulness. And it's also for future. It's future. What's, what's the motivation for alms? Compassion for mankind. Having passion for mankind, and yet it is, it has, you do lend for the Lord. Amen. Remember that. Tithing is for obedience. First fruit is what? Uh, gratitude and thankfulness. And then alms is compassion, passion for mankind to mankind. Amen. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you. Amen.